Hello, Mystery Knox listeners, and welcome back to the podcast. I'm Kim. And I'm Mary. And for today's case, we are going to explore the mysterious death of screenwriter Gary DeVore. Traveling from New Mexico to California, Gary vanished, only for his body to be found a year later, still in his SUV. But this wasn't your typical open and shut case, at least not to the people who knew Gary. You see, certain things were missing when they found Gary and his vehicle, and what they were, were shocking. This is the case of Gary DeVore. So Mary, this case that we're going to talk about, it originally caught my eye because he was traveling from New Mexico to California. And obviously, if people listen to our previous podcast about Get to Know Us, they'll know that Mm -hmm. we both grew up in New Mexico. So I thought that that was really interesting because um, because you don't, at least I don't, find that many. No, you don't hear about it. I mean, really. The only other, like recently, that made the news was the what West Mesa. Mm-hmm. And that was actually years ago. Um, but listeners, for two people that grew up in New Mexico, we will obviously be covering the West Mesa murders in a future podcast. Let's get into this story. It's crazy. It took us down a rabbit hole, like always. This is one of those cases, and it's like all the other cases we've done, where it's like, Mm -hmm. it's a simple subject of finding out who this person was, what happened, and the outcome, right? Mm Mm-hmm. And then we actually dive into it (laughs) and find all this stuff, and it's so overwhelming. And we keep going down the rabbit hole. (laughs) All right, listeners. Grab your snacks, grab your coffee or your tea or your wa'a, and let's get to it. How does a Hollywood screenwriter go missing without a trace, only to be found a year later and under suspicious circumstances? It sounds like the plot to a movie, but unfortunately, this story isn't fiction. This is exactly what happened to screenwriter Gary DeVore on his drive home from New Mexico to California. Gary was known for films like Raw Deal, starring Arnold Schwarzenegger, and Dogs of War, starring Christopher Walken. He was a very successful Hollywood screenwriter and producer, but all of that vanished with him on June 27, 1997. According to Marsha Mason, who was a friend of Gary's, Gary had left her house to start his drive back home to California in his white Eddie Bauer edition Ford Explorer. According to an article from Entertainment Weekly, Gary had agreed to drop Mason's niece off at the Albuquerque airport before heading back home to California. Mason later told USA Today that DeVore left, quote, feeling good, running high, end quote. Gary liked to spend time in Santa Fe, New Mexico, at the home of his friend when he was experiencing writer's block. He was working on a script that was to be the remake of Robert Mitchum's 1949 film, The Big Steal. According to an article from the Daily Mail, The Big Steal, he told friends, would be the hardest-hitting film studios have ever seen, featuring disturbing details about the U.S. invasion of Panama, end quote. Sadly, though, Gary never made it home that night. The last known person to speak to Gary that we know of was his wife, Wendy Oates DeVore. She had tried calling him earlier that night, but he never picked up. According to Wendy, Gary called her back around 1.15 a.m. while he was on the road. He asked Wendy if that was her trying to call him. Wendy replied, quote, Who else would it be at one o'clock in the morning? Where are you? End quote. Gary stated he was past Barstow, but didn't give an exact location of his whereabouts. He also told her he wasn't tired despite driving all night from Santa Fe, which if you guys don't know how far that is, it's 735 miles from Barstow to Santa Fe, or almost an 11-hour drive. However, he told Wendy if he got tired, he'd pull over and not to wait up for him. His last words to Wendy were, quote, see you later, end quote. On this last call, according to Wendy, he sounded strange and agitated, which was most unlike her husband and led her to believe that someone may have been in the car with him at the time of this phone call. Gary was 5 feet 11 inches and 185 pounds. He had a salt and pepper beard and was 55 years old. He was last seen wearing jeans, cowboy boots, and a straw cowboy hat. He also had $300 with him, 
his gun, and some credit cards. A year later, an amateur detective, Douglas Crawford, who had a hunch about where Gary's body may be, said to check the California aqueduct. Turns out, he was right. Gary's body, still in his vehicle with his seatbelt on, was found under 15 feet of water. Not surprisingly, to me anyway, Wendy was a bit suspicious. Yeah, I would be too. Yeah, for sure. Quote, I want to know how the hell he knew, said a shaken Wendy DeVore, Gary's widow. And I want to know who he is, and I want to know if he was interested in that information, why he didn't come forward sooner, end quote. Now, according to an article from LA Times, quote, Crawford, 35, said he read a newspaper article marking the one-year anniversary of DeVore's disappearance and was reminded of a case involving a missing Orange County woman who was later found to have crashed into the California aqueduct. He theorized DeVore may have suffered a similar fate, end quote. He then went to the area and searched around the aqueduct, where he stated he found debris that matched Gary's white Ford Explorer. To me, it just seems a little fishy, considering there was an extensive search for Gary, including ground and air searches, and Wendy even hired private detectives to look for her husband. And according to an article from CBS News, professional rescue teams and a crew of volunteers helped her in the year-long search concentrated on the aqueduct area. However, the police stated that after they looked into Crawford, they believed his story and he was never a suspect. But talking about that, though, where it says um, the police didn't think he was a suspect, I thought that was... Mm-hmm. Like, the fact that he was like, oh, by the way, check the aqueduct. I mean, that's that's suspicious. Right. I mean... No, very suspicious. And, I mean, according to them, they did look into him, and then they... I couldn't find out, you know what made them believe he wasn't a suspect, but they don't believe that he was a suspect. So, just a little bit of extra information for the listeners about Crawford. There was an email that he actually sent to the police, basically detailing how he uh, supposedly figured out that Gary's body was in the aqueduct. So, however, I'm not going to read it because it is really long, but... We will post a link on our blog that you can click on, and it will take you to the image of the letter, and you can read it for yourself if you're interested. After they found Gary's body, the next question was, how did he get there? What happened? Quote, it seemed he had hit the barriers on the California aqueduct and flipped into the water below, end quote. Even though Gary's body was found, it's what wasn't found that has people shocked and questioning the results of the investigation. Gary's Toshiba laptop, which contained the Finnish script, The Big Steel, was missing, along with his gun, a Colt 45, which he always carried with him on long road trips, his ammunition, and most shocking of all, his hands. His hands. Because that doesn't flag it as suspicious at all. The whole thing was, or still is, suspicious. A little over 20 years on, and it's still being talked about, and I can see why. The aqueduct was searched extensively and no other items were found, nor were there any signs of impact. Quote, the official accident explanation of Gary's death is certainly creative, if nothing else. By the police's own calculations, in order to have ended up in the aqueduct, Gary would have had to have driven in excess of 110 kilometers an hour without headlights. The investigation found that they had been deliberately turned off. Then he drove the wrong way up a major highway for 3.2 kilometers unnoticed and through the only gap in the road rail, a mere five meters wide, all without causing any damage to either the rail or the car. Evil Knievel on his best night couldn't do that, end quote, snorts Hollywood private investigator Don Crutchfield, who worked for the likes of Judy Garland, Frank Sinatra, and Marlon Brando. Even though there are many unanswered questions regarding Gary's death, the California Highway Patrol closed the case, ruling it an accident, even though his cause of death was listed as undetermined. After the break, we will dive into the theories regarding Gary's death. Was it really an accident or something more sinister? Stay with us. Now back to the case. What might be even crazier than Gary's actual disappearance and death are the theories in this case. Now these ranged from aliens, suicide, and an accidental death to being abducted and murdered. Quote, unsurprisingly, the case became popular with conspiracy theorists, with many people speculating DeVore may have been murdered by anyone from Russian drug gangs to the CIA, end quote. 
However, the more popular opinion being a CIA cover-up. Let's pick apart the scene. First, let's talk about him traveling from New Mexico to California. His wife said he sounded strange, that she thought there was probably another person in the car with him. Saying if this was true, maybe someone found him like he was being followed and they finally caught up with him when he pulled into a gas station or a rest stop. I'm not saying this is what happened, but as speculation, saying he had made a pit stop, that would have been a perfect time for someone who was keeping tabs on him to catch up with him. Which he did, by the way. According to a source from Entertainment Weekly, we do know that he stopped to get gas in California and he paid with his Visa card. This was a few hours before he called Wendy. It's noted that a search team used his cell phone signals to track his gas station stops, which they had pinpointed his route along Highway 14, southwest of the Mojave Desert. In terms of direction, with regards to Highway 14, that did put him some miles outside of Barstow, but it would have made more sense for him to take Highway 15 as it led directly through Los Angeles to their home in Santa Barbara. Taking Highway 14 would be taking an extra estimated 30 minutes of time. That's interesting. For having driven so long already, why would you add more time to your drive if you didn't need to? I mean, unless there was, like, an accident or something? Possibly. I'm under the impression that he may have left later in the afternoon, considering the time his wife had called him. But also, why? It makes more sense to travel while you have light. Even if you're traveling on a high, it just doesn't make sense. However, if he's used to that sort of travel, I get that too, even though it's not the smartest option. Yeah, and also remember, he did drop off his friend's niece in Albuquerque before making his way back to California, so maybe that's why he started later than he had intended to? We should also take into consideration that DeVore had previously worked as a professional long-haul driver, so friends and family do not believe he would have done anything daft on the road, even if he was tired. Maybe he had a perfectly good reason for driving the extra miles rather than taking a shortcut home or something happened along the way, like you said, Kim. Maybe there was a crash and he had to go the long way around. There are just so many theories on this. I'd also like to talk about how his body was found. Finding Gary's body was strange, and more specifically, who found it was even stranger. There isn't much about Douglas Crawford, the man who had this hunch, but seemingly how he just knew Devore could be found in an aqueduct is mighty suspicious. And like I previously said, not much can be found on Douglas Crawford either. It almost seems planted. Yeah, and as I said earlier, I had a problem with this too. The only thing I could find out about Douglas Crawford was that he was an unemployed lawyer from San Diego. From reading articles about the location in which Gary was found, it's my understanding that the aqueduct had been previously searched. Then Crawford mentions to check it again, and that's when they find Gary's vehicle with his skeletal remains in it. However, there are some oddities that contribute to the mystery of the case. Gary's remains were found strapped into the vehicle. Anyone who knew Gary knew that he didn't wear a seatbelt, so mark that as the first detail that had people questioning the validity of the scene. Another unusual detail was that his wallet was found in his back pocket. This was strange because according to Gary's family and friends, he never did that. Another prominent detail that stuck out like a sore thumb was in fact his hands. They were gone. What's even weirder, a few days after finding his body, with no sign of his hands, they searched the vehicle again and found hand bones under the back seat. Wait, they found hand bones under the back seat after they had already searched the scene? What? Yeah, here's a quote explaining what they found. Quote, The hand bones recovered from the river were incomplete. The official reports state that there were 23 when actually there were just three. These did not include Gary's deformed little finger, which would have been an obvious identifier, and it was impossible to extract DNA from because they were too old. A British research team, which was warned to drop the investigation by a Department of Defense contractor, has also secured testimony from the coroner which reveals the human hands said to be recovered from divorce car were in fact around 200 years old. End quote. Side note, who is hands just lying around and then a situation like this comes up and then light bulb? I have the perfect thing to throw people off its trail. Though that's just more questions and a whole lot of what the fucks, if anything. For real, though. Like, I, I really don't understand how 200-year-old hand bones ended up in his SUV. It makes no sense at all. No, not at all. His gun and ammunition going missing, the seatbelt debacle, wallet in his back pocket, hands missing, 200-year-old hands being found. Why not add a missing laptop to the mix? And if you ask me, I think that is hitting the nail on the head. 
If there is any sort of evidence to try to steer away from a government cover-up, a laptop going missing with the script he just finished about a government conspiracy just added more fuel to the fire. The script. This was major. Apparently the script touched on some sort of cover-up, and that the invasion in Panama was just some sort of distraction for what really went on. What exactly? We don't really know. According to an article in Fortean Times, quote, the screenplay was acutely critical of U.S. foreign policy, presenting a picture of a country ravaged by the U.S. military, in which U.S. Army intelligence organizes the theft of Noriega's drug money. Noriega, the article explains, ran a well-known honey trap, inviting diplomats to his home filled with alcohol, drugs, beautiful women, and beautiful men, and covertly filming their antics, end quote. For those that don't know, here's a little history lesson as to who Noriega was, because I get not many people know the significance of who he was. From the New York Times, quote, Noriega, who became the de facto leader of the country of Panama by promoting himself to full general of the armed forces in 1983, had a decades-long head-spinning relationship with the United States, shifting from cooperative ally and informant for American drug and intelligence agencies to shady adversary selling secrets to political enemies of the United States in the Western Hemisphere and tipping off drug cartels. Whose side he was on was often hard to tell. It was an awkward embrace that befitted the history of American and Panamanian relations since, since the United States built the Panama Canal early in the 20th century. The United States continued to operate the canal and govern a strip of territory alongside it before turning it over to Panama on December 31, 1999. Noriega died on May 29th, 2017. He was 83. So this brings me to my next topic of discussion. How involved was Gary with the CIA? We do know that Gary was very close with the CIA case officer Charles Chase Brandon, who was helping him with his research for the script. According to sources, he also traveled to Panama with CIA special ops, but told his wife Wendy he was going to Panama with his production team. What if, and skipping slightly ahead, this Charles Brandon was brought onto the case to feed Gary just enough information to keep him happy and to steer him away from what really happened, but not divulge the true facts. So yeah, that's a very interesting theory. I could definitely see that happening, you know, like you said, just to keep him happy so that he writes the script, but to not go into so much detail, as you said. And another interesting thing, or I guess odd thing, is... I just don't understand why he was so into uh, the CIA stuff. Like, he was really good friends with Brandon. He traveled all over with them just to do research for your script. Yeah. Like, that makes no sense. I get that you're doing research, but the meetings did seem a little excessive, especially for a screenwriter. Especially since he could have consulted with a military advisor. Yeah, exactly. Gary's widow, Wendy, told the Daily Mail, quote, When we first married, he told me he got a lot of calls from government agencies. He told me to ignore it, so I did. If the phone rang, I could take a message or say he was out, but not to speak to them, really. We had a few at first, then not very many. Then in the last month, one man was calling all the time, end quote. Also, quote, Within a week of his disappearance, men from the FBI, CIA, NSA, and DOD arrived at the couple's home in Santa Barbara, end quote. But going back to his research, quote, DeVore's meetings, however, were beyond anything that could be considered normal for a screenwriter, end quote. Seriously, he goes on that many trips with the CIA to Panama. He was a screenwriter, or was he a CIA operative? He seemingly was living some sort of double life. His wife didn't know. He never told her much, just of meetings and trips, possibly to keep her out of the loop. Maybe to even keep her safe. Quote, Currently, the police files that deal with his death are classified and unavailable even to Wendy DeVore. Perhaps, should they ever be released, the many rumors surrounding DeVore's death would end up confirmed or debunked. End quote. So, this actually reminds me of something that I read while doing research. Um, the guy that we just talked about, Brandon the CIA operative who was a friend of Gary's. Mm -hmm. There is some speculation that the um, after Gary's death, he went to Wendy's house and he went into Gary's room where the computer was, where he had all of his research. 
Or he and, did his writing, right? His screenwriting. Yeah. Writing. yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, he was in there alone. And when he left, all of that research and screenwriting, everything was wiped from the computer. Mm-hmm. So there is speculation that he was the one who did it. Now, I'm not saying he was because I don't think anything is confirmed. But when Wendy asked him what he was doing, he basically said that he just wanted to be alone in Gary's room and just for like the memories of that they had, like with their friendship and stuff. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Despite this case being closed and ruled out as an accident, speculation and talk of what happened to Gary DeVore can't help but be discussed some 20 years on. Whether it was truly an accident or a CIA cover-up, we'll leave that up to you, the listener, to decide. All right, Mystery Knox listeners, that's it for our case today. Thank you so much for joining us. As always, we'd love to hear your ideas or theories on this case, so please let us know on our Instagram and Facebook at Mystery Knox Podcast, on Twitter at Mystery Knox Pod, or you can even send us a voice message on Anchor at anchor.fm slash mystery Knox podcast. A list of our sources and pictures from this case can be found on our blog at mystery Knox podcast.wordpress.com. Your support is always appreciated. So if you enjoyed what you heard, please let us know by giving us a rating or a review on Apple podcast or wherever you listen to your podcast. And don't forget to subscribe and share every little bit helps. We'll see you on our next episode, and remember, stay weird, stay curious. (laughs) Mischief managed.